Tiny motion sensors known as accelerometers are at the heart of much of today's technology. Built into a smartphone, for example, the sensor detects both movement and the angle at which the phone is being held to trigger the rotation of the screen. This little chip is why a smartphone knows when it has moved. These motion sensors are tiny but smart because they can detect every move. They start with silicon disks, called wafers. Each wafer will be used to make thousands of motion sensors. A technician aligns the disks in a cassette, using the flat part of each one as a reference point. Once properly aligned, a mechanism lowers the silicon wafers onto a carrier made of quartz because it can withstand intense heat. The technician loads the wafers into the furnace. Inside, 1100 degrees Celsius heat and steam cause an oxide to form on the surface of each wafer. It'll act as an electrical insulator. Then it's into what's known as a sputter system. Here, inert gas ions bombard aluminum, causing it to sputter onto the wafer until an even layer accumulates. This aluminum layer will serve as a conductor of electricity. The next machine deposits a light-sensitive chemical onto the wafer. The wafer spins, allowing the chemical to flow evenly across the surface. This all happens under the glow of yellow light to prevent the untimely activation of the chemical, which reacts to bright light just like an unexposed photographic negative would. They're now ready for that bright light. UV light beams through tiny patterns on a glass plate to activate the light-sensitive chemical. The patterns transfer to the wafer's surface, forming an outline for thousands of motion sensors. Another chemical then flows onto the silicon wafer to further develop these minuscule images. Next, lasers locate the wafer's flat edge, signaling a chuck to spin it into proper position for plasma etching. The etching creates thousands of free-moving 3D structures. Each one is a motion sensor. After etching, a sprayer blasts the surface with carbon dioxide. It's the only way to clean it without damaging the now movable sensors. At the next station, a robotic arm flips the wafer into position. A tray moves under the robot and it places the wafer on it. The tray retracts and loads the wafer into a clamping system. It then collects a second silicon wafer and places it on the first one in the clamp. The second wafer acts as a lid to protect the individual sensors. Held in the clamp, a machine heat seals the two wafers and the bond is complete. Next, a computerized saw cuts grooves into the top wafer only, while a steady stream of water keeps the dust down. The saw exposes the aluminum layer on the bottom wafer, something that will allow each sensor to make an electrical connection. The platform now moves the wafer a millimeter at a time so that a probe can test each sensor and confirm it performs correctly. This continues until every sensor on the wafer has been tested. From a plain silicon wafer to a unit that contains thousands of motion sensors, this process has taken three weeks. After the individual sensors have been cut out and encased in plastic, they're ready for a final test. A robot loads each sensor into a test socket. The socket both tests the sensor's performance and programs it to customer specifications. A robot packages the sensors for shipping. And once installed in phones, tablets and computers, these motion sensors will be ready for action. If you've been to an airport, 
You've seen mobile belt loaders on the tarmac. They drive from the terminal to the aircraft, align their built-in conveyor belt with the entrance to the cargo hold, then load baggage or cargo on board. When an aircraft arrives, they do all that in reverse to unload baggage or cargo. A turn of the control handle adjusts the height of the front of the belt loader, enabling it to reach the cargo hold of even the tallest aircraft. The rear height is also adjustable, so the airport baggage handlers can set it at a level comfortable for loading. The vehicle and the conveyor belt are separate units. In this part of the factory, workers construct the conveyor's steel frame. They weld together all the steel parts. Then grind all the weld seams flat so that the belt will move over the frame smoothly. Workers install a cross member just past the midpoint of the frame. It will connect with two sets of lift arms installed in the vehicle. One which raises and lowers the front of the conveyor, the other which raises and lowers the rear. Workers insert alignment pins to position the cross member on the frame correctly, then weld it in place. The vehicle's chassis is also made of welded steel. Workers blast the chassis and conveyor frame with a metal abrasive. This removes rust and other debris, prepping the surface for paint to adhere properly. They caulk all the unwelded seams to prevent corrosion. Then spray a coat of primer, followed by a coat of industrial grade paint in the color the customer requested. Once the paint dries, assembly can resume. On the conveyor frame, they install the motor which drives the belt. There are two options available, this hydraulic motor powered by the vehicle's engine or an electric motor powered by battery. The motor rotates two large metal rollers, one at the front of the frame, the other at the rear. The belt wraps around these rollers so that when they turn, the belt moves. Between the end rollers, running the entire length of the conveyor, workers install 58 smaller metal rollers. These form the floor of the conveyor and can support up to a ton of cargo. The motor runs these rollers forward or in reverse, depending on whether the belt is loading or unloading the aircraft. The belt itself is made of high-strength, tire-grade rubber with an anti-skid texture on the surface. To be long enough to loop around the 7.5 meter long conveyor, plus the end rollers, the belt is 15 meters in length. The ends have teeth which fit into each other like a zipper and fasten with a metal pin. Elsewhere in the factory, technicians install components on the vehicle chassis. First, the front and rear axles. Then, on each axle, two wheels, with tires specifically designed for long life on the airport tarmac. At the rear of the chassis, they install the hydraulic cylinder, which raises and lowers the rear lift arms. Then, the vehicle's engine, which can be either gas, diesel, propane, or electric powered. The vehicle drives at a maximum speed of just 43 kilometers per hour, but that's more than sufficient for traveling between the terminal and the aircraft. After installing the power steering system, technicians run wiring for the lights and other electrical components, run hydraulic hoses for the brakes and lift cylinders, and install the controls for the conveyor. They install the hydraulic cylinder, which raises the front lift arms. Then connect the fluid hoses to the hydraulic pump. Next, they install the front and rear lift arms, along with the safety brace underneath, to use when mechanics are working beneath the conveyor. They attach the lift arms to the front and rear cylinders, which expand to raise the arms and retract to lower them. Now workers hoist the conveyor over the vehicle, and bolt the front and rear lift arms to the cross member on the conveyor's underside. The two units are now one mobile belt loader, ready to roll off the line and hit the tarmac. <laughs>